In 1532, 170 Spanish adventurers landed on the coast of the Inca Empire. The conquistadores described themselves as being troubled with a strange disease, a disease of the heart, they said, for which gold was the specific remedy. Today, the gold is gone, and so is the empire of the Incas. The Spanish came for treasure and found it. But what if there was a treasure more precious to the Incas than gold? A treasure that the Spanish never found. When the Spanish arrived, the Inca Empire could field more than 100,000 men-at-arms. There were only 170 Spaniards. Yet the lightly armed conquistadores slaughtered 7,000 Incas in their first day of battle. 40 Incas for every Spaniard. Within 50 years, out of a population of 7 million, 5 million were dead. How could an empire of the size and sophistication of that of Rome be defeated so easily? The orthodox account, the Spanish account, is that it just was. Four thousand miles away and four hundred years later, historian Bill Sullivan read this account when still a student and felt then it wasn't enough. For over twenty years, Sullivan has travelled back and forth from his home in Massachusetts to the mountains of Peru in search of a deeper truth. He was convinced that behind the military clash, there had to be a more profound story, a clash of cultures, a collision between two incompatible ways of seeing and understanding the world. You know the Indi first Indiana Jones movie where Indy's looking for Marion in the Kasbah and uh, this Sufi warrior comes out and does this amazing riff with his sword and Indy just goes and shoots him. That, that's the conquest. It's two totally different worlds, two totally different sets of objectives and one of them had to lose out. According to Bill Sullivan, more than the military might of the two sides, it was the psychological state of the Incas that was the key to what really happened. It's been his lifelong conviction that if he could get inside and understand the Inca mind, he would find a deeper history of the last days of the Incas. The key to Bill Sullivan's quest was a simple question. When the Incas found the barbarians were at the gate, when they realized the end was nigh, what would they want to save? What would you want to survive you into the future? What would be your most precious treasure? The Spanish, the answer was simple, gold. And not as works of Inca art and beauty, only as bullion. Everything they looted, they melted down. Only a few trinkets escaped the Spanish furnaces. Bill believes for the Incas there was a treasure far more precious than gold and thinks he knows where it's hidden. He has spent 20 years studying the Spanish chronicles of the conquest and believes they contain a forgotten record, a glimpse inside a lost world. <laughs> 
not in the parts every other historian has studied, the factual account of what the Spanish did and found, but encoded in Inca folk tales, also recorded in those chronicles, and utterly overlooked for four centuries. Bill Sullivan, alone among the experts, believes that when properly decoded, the myths tell a history of the Inca Empire so secret that it was known only to the Inca high priests. He believes the Incas who told these stories to the Spanish were doing so because they wanted someone in the future to decode them and know we are not savages. This is who we were. This is what we achieved. This is what we believed. This is our epitaph. I think it's a shame that in our time we've sort of grown accustomed to thinking that the messages that come to us from the past through myth are somehow inherently meaningless, that they are sort of the uh, poetic imaginings of savage people. Because it really misses the point, because there have been moments when I knew to a certainty that I was listening to a message that had been encrypted 1,300 years ago, 2,000 years ago, and meant to be understood. We owe the Incas a tremendous debt because they have allowed us a very, very kind of a clear window back into the past. History records the tragedy of the Incas. A once proud people were utterly defeated and humiliated. Their culture swept aside. Yet if Bill is right, we are forced to ask what kind of people, in the face of defeat, could have had the presence of mind to leave to the future a message in a bottle containing what was, in effect, their declaration of the human spirit. Sullivan's research began where everyone has to begin, with what the Spanish saw and chronicled as they traveled up into the mountains. The country is populous. There are mines in many parts of it. They have stores of fuel and maize and of all the other necessaries. We know the empire they found was only 90 years old, but it was the last and greatest expression of cultural ideas nearly 2,000 years old. So that message in a bottle could be the key to 2,000 years of Andean history. The chronicles were written by priests, by soldiers, and by administrators administrators of the Spanish crown. And naturally, they had different perspectives. The administrators were interested in where resources were and in descriptions of the extent of the empire. But there's a human element that comes out in any one of these chronicles of a curiosity and, and an amazement at the sophistication and scale upon which this empire operated. What they discovered was a culture that in this hard environment of isolated valleys had found a way to unite disparate peoples. The Inca Empire at its height contained at least a hundred quite distinct groups trading together at peace. It stretched from Colombia to Chile and fed seven million people. The ideals of cooperation that underlay the empire 
were its real genius. Ideals that had kept the Andes at peace for 800 years. Something the restless tribes of Europe have never managed. And we might never have known how all this was achieved, except for the Spanish. In the chronicles, along with their inventory of the empire, the Spanish also wrote down what Bill thinks is the key to understanding the cooperative culture of the Andes, their myths. One of the remarkable services that the Spanish have provided to posterity is that uh, they took down these myths in relatively pure form. They didn't try to understand them and they didn't try to sort of Christianize them or put a, a Western religious spin on them because they wanted them to be strange and because they wanted them to appear apart. In a number of cases, you'll find a chronicler who will set down in, in pristine form an Andean myth and then conclude by saying something like, had these people not been so dull and blind and had they possessed writing, perhaps they would not have been so stupid. At the start of his project, Bill had spent six months living with the Indians, learning their language and beliefs. He did not presume that the Inca myths were meaningless superstition. He'd studied the highly controversial hypothesis that a knowledge of astronomy had spread around the world before recorded history began, and that the great civilizations from China and India to Egypt all used the exact same code to preserve knowledge of the stars in myth. And these ancient cultures were obsessed by the stars because they saw a sky we never do, whereas we see only a scattering of the brightest stars. They, without polluted skies, saw the full glory of the Milky Way. If Bill could prove that myths were encoded astronomy, it would rewrite ancient history. He believed that Inca astronomy was descended from that ancient tradition and so could be the test case. Incas were the last living branch of an ancient tree, which may already have been old when the pyramids were built. I was interested in the myths. I was looking for myths because I was working on the hypothesis that there was astronomy encrypted in them. However unconventional the idea, Bill thought he could test it. Like the Spanish priests before him, Bill went to the villages and collected the stories from those who still had knowledge of myths and stars. And the first myth he came across was the creation myth. Long, long ago, at Lake Titicaca, a tall, bearded stranger appeared with a staff in his hand. And he went to the island of Titicaca in the middle of the lake, and there he commanded the sun, the moon, and the stars to rise. And they rose. And at the same time, he took clay and made models, each of a man and a woman, and created the tribal ancestors of every tribe in the Andes. And to each pair, he gave the language that they would speak the songs that they would sing, the seeds that they would plant, and the dances that they would dance. And then he breathed on them and gave them life and told them all to go under the earth and to rise in their different homelands. And they rose from springs, uh, from trees, from caves. And these places are called pacarinas, which means places of dawn. What's phenomenally interesting about this myth is that when the Spanish appeared, they found that in, in the real world, these ideas were spread all over the Andes. Each tribe had a pacarina, a place of dawning, and each tribe had a waka. The significance of the waka, which was a representation of the lineage ancestors of each tribe, was that the waka was in the shape of an animal or a bird, and that it represented a star or constellation, so that each tribal unit in the Andes considered itself 
to have come from the stars and that when you died you returned to the homeland of your waka in the stars. And so the metaphor is that each tribe and its homeland is like a constellation in, in the sky. And the chartered document of Andean civilization is contained in this myth because what it says is that despite vast differences between peoples as far as their language and customs, they are all united as children of a common creator. And in the same way that the stars in the sky are all different from each other and each has its own particular location that it occupies, nonetheless the stars move together in harmony. Bill was right. The myth did contain astronomy. And the astronomy was the key not only to the myth's meaning, but to the Andean ideals of cooperation. For the people of the Andes, these astronomical ideas were even reflected in everyday life. God was called the bearer of the millstone, the mill that ground out fate on Earth. He moved the stars in the heavens exactly as he moved the people's fate on Earth. But in a collision between radically different cultures, such sophistication is nearly always lost upon the victors. The men who conquered the Inca Empire were the younger sons of a poor nobility. There were no prospects for them in Spain. But held out to them by church and king, was the glory of conquest. For God, the conversion of the heathen. For king, gold and empire. And for themselves, adventure, fortune and power. These were the conquistadores. Por eso, Padre de bondad, celebramos ahora el memorial de nuestra reconciliación. Proclamamos la obra de tu amor, Cristo tu Hijo, a través del sufrimiento y de la muerte en cruz, Cordero de Dios que quitas el pecado. The church in Spain was the church of the Inquisition, powerful, fanatical, dogmatic. Este es el Cordero de Dios. This was the church which insisted the sun revolved around the earth and which rooted out the unbelievers and burned them. The church was hungry for souls. The secular power was hungry for empire. God and king had common cause. the armies of Christendom, who turned back the Muslims from Europe, were paid in Inca gold. Pizarro led the conquistadores against the Incas in the Andes, Cortes against the Aztecs of Central America. When Pizarro arrived in Peru, there were seven million Incas. Fifty years later, five million were dead. As the conquest progressed, Spanish priests set about imposing muscular Catholicism with all its hatred of astronomy. They systematically began rooting out the Inca's old beliefs. It is just one of the ironies of history that of all the things the Incas could have built their culture around, astronomy was anathema to the church.
priests were particularly interested in religion because, uh, well, to be blunt, they, they intended to destroy it and they wanted to know their enemy. There was a death sentence for anyone who would have anything to do with the old religion, especially the astronomical religion, which quite frankly frightened the Spanish. The native peoples were quite aware of what was at stake. At the same time, they did come forth and give us these stories because in those stories they well knew was the essence of their civilization because the myths were a vessel des designed to sail the seas of time. In fact, field work by Sullivan and other mainstream academics has found that a surprising amount of Inca astronomy has survived. And I had done six months of field work in Peru and Bolivia just to find out the names of the stars uh, as far as the uh, peasant Indians today understand them. And most of the peasant Indians throughout the Andes know at least a dozen constellations that they use to monitor their agricultural year. Even today, planting corn is timed according to a group of stars, which we call the Pleiades, and whose Indian name refers to a pile of seeds. And it's this astronomy that, after his own field work, Bill Sullivan believes he has found encoded in the myths. Astronomy whose significance the Spanish and all the experts since have never understood but which he now thinks holds the key to the secret of the Inca Empire. Long ago, so our grandparents tell us, there was a shepherd, and he went high into the mountains to visit his flocks. And when he got there, he found that they were neither eating nor drinking. Instead, they stood all night looking up into the sky and crying out. And the shepherd became angry. And he said, what's the matter with you? I give you the best pasture, the purest water to drink, and all you do is sit around crying out at the stars. And then the Yama said to the man, listen to me very carefully. And the shepherd was shocked because it was as if a man had spoken to him. And the Yama said, do you see those stars rising over that mountain, Vilcacoto? Those stars mean that in exactly one month's time, the entire world is going to be destroyed by a flood. And the shepherd believed him, and he took his family, and he escaped to the top of the highest mountain in the world. And as the rains came, and it rained and it rained, until only the tip of the mountain stuck out of the water. And so crowded was it on the top of the mountain that Fox slipped and got his tail wet. And that's why, to this day, Fox's tail is black. This unlikely story is what Bill had to turn into astronomy. His starting point was that from his fieldwork, Bill knew the Incas had constellations they called the llama and the fox. So were the adventures in the myth code for movements of the llama and fox constellations in the sky? The unique aspect of Andean astronomy is its use of uh, a body of objects which, which um, we just don't have in our astronomy. Uh, they're called black cloud constellations, and what they are is um, large clouds of interstellar dust in the Milky Way, which appear sort of like inky black uh, spots, and they have shapes and they have names. And the, the reason that uh, 
it's unique to this region is because of the altitude. And in fact, we know from the chronicles that the priest astronomers frequented the same precincts as the Yamas, which is to say above 14,000 feet. And when you get that high, um, the sky is absolutely dazzling and the Milky Way looks like a neon light. Well, that's an exaggeration, but the Milky Way is very bright. And these clouds, are they're right there, you can see them. I began to try to imagine uh, what it meant that a Yama would be looking and pointing at a, a certain group of stars. And I thought, well, maybe, maybe the Yama was looking towards uh, sunrise just before dawn when the, the rising stars are extinguished. I began to think in those terms. And that would mean that the Yama was setting in the east. And quite suddenly, it occurred to me that the name of the mountain, which was Wilkakoto, literally means Sun Pleiades Mountain. And that's probably as, uh, as generous an offering of the description of a Hilayakal rise event, which very simply is the last star you can see before the gathering dawn extinguishes starlight. And so suddenly there was a picture of the, the Yama setting in the west, and the Pleiades rising in the east, and as soon as I went to a star chart, I saw that that, that is just how it is. They, they have a, the Yama sets at the same time the Pleiades rises. At least the myth encoded something astronomical, a snapshot of some night sky. But if the stars had ever really been in that position, it was not easy to say. Because over thousands of years, the constellations move imperceptibly around the sky. Where Pisces was 2,000 years ago is where Aquarius is today, a movement known as precession. So to find that particular night sky, he needed to make the skies move back in time. Well, to be honest, I mean, it took me about two years to become even moderately comfortable with trying to close my eyes and imagine the Earth inside the fixed sphere of stars, and then on top of that, the, uh, the crossing of the plane of the ecliptic, and on top of that, the, the angle of the Milky Way. But then when I wanted to try and set the whole thing in motion with a precessional wobble, no. Uh, no, it's, my circuit board was overloaded at that point. To make time run backwards, he needed help from experts at the Boston Planetarium. This was the make or break test. I was very nervous when I, when I was at the Ibs Planetarium because I'd spent two years rummaging around trying to make sense out of it and I, I really felt that I'd got it. I really felt this had, had to be it. And uh, if it hadn't worked out in the planetarium, I was out of bullets. And I said, I'd like to see the heliacal rise of the Pleiades uh, on May 21st. That is exactly one month before the solstice. So he precessed or just tilted the machine. And when he got to 650 AD, he said, there's your date. You know, miracle of modern science. And I, w I was stunned. So there were the Pleiades appearing over the horizon just as the sun rose exactly as the myth had described. Of course, it could have been just a lucky coincidence. But if the myth is about June solstice, they'll give you a cross-check at December solstice. Then I said, I'd like to see the heliacal rise of the Milky Way at December solstice in 650 AD. And lo and behold, there's the fox rising, and the horizon cuts his tail, and just as the myth says, his tail is in a drink, and that's why fox's tail is black. So that night sky had existed. He knew he was looking at the stars as the Andean priests had seen them in 650 AD. The next question was, why had they felt it important enough to encode the June solstice in a myth? Was the myth a clue to some event they wanted to commemorate? Had something happened on that date? What we found is that for the first time in about 800 years, the Milky Way was no longer visible on the horizon. Well, so what? 
In fact, the Milky Way uh, was of supreme importance in Andean cosmological thought. The Quechua word for the Milky Way is Mayu, and that means river. And this great river in the sky was conceived as a causeway which linked the human world to the supernatural worlds, the land of the gods and the land of the ancestors. And so, in cosmological terms, what the events of 650 AD meant was that the access to the region of the sky, which was the land of the gods, was no longer accessible. It meant that the gods must leave the earth and return to the land of the gods, or metaphorically that that Andean civilization was going to take some kind of a hit. And Andean civilization had suffered a catastrophe in 650 AD. In that year, the archaeological record shows the beginning of 800 years of civil war, the long era of living together in harmony, which had begun in 200 BC and was recorded in the creation myth, was over. And the myth marked the boundary. I began to have kind of a, an eerie sensation, and at the same time, um, a little discomfort, because the, the two events fit, fit together so perfectly. Um, I could see that you know, a skeptical person would say, well, you just played around with a planetarium until you got a date that you wanted, but, uh, well, in the first place, that's not how it happened, and in the second place, uh, later, a second myth completely corroborated this date from a totally different perspective. After five years of painstaking work, Bill Sullivan felt he had at last his first glimpse into the mind of the Incas. He was beginning to understand how they conceived of the world, the first step in reconstructing Inca history and culture. In fact, the Incas had towns and cities, paid taxes, and had laws and welfare. They had ended 800 years of civil war and had returned peace and abundance to the Andes. The Incas respected ethnic and religious differences. The taxes they gathered they used to feed the poorest. And everything they did on a practical level was tied up with their myths and their religious beliefs. Bill's claim was that all of this was also tied up with astronomy. But so far in the myths, he'd only decoded the meaning of animals and people. But many Inca myths talked about the god, Wiracocha. Could myths about their god be decoded into astronomy as well? Or was this where his ideas broke down? The second myth that I found was a description of the last days of Wiracocha on Earth. <laughs> When the god was old, uh, he came to a place and met a man called Aputambu, who was the father of Manco Capac. And Manco Capac is, is the mythical first Inca emperor. And being old and being ready to leave the earth, he handed a piece of his staff over to Manco Capac and then left the world by a river called Chacamarca. <laughs> I knew that the third rule of the technical language of myth is gods are planets. If gods really were planets, might he be able to transform a story about a god and a king into a story about planets? He knew Wiracocha was Saturn and that the Incas referred to themselves as the regents of Jupiter. So a mythical meeting between god and king ought to signify a conjunction of the planets Saturn and Jupiter. When I went to the planetary tables, I went to look for a conjunction of Saturn and Jupiter somewhere in the vicinity of 650 AD. 
Now, Saturn and Jupiter go into conjunction once every 20 years, so to find a conjunction is not that significant. But when I opened the book, I found that there was a conjunction exactly in 650 A.D. at sunset uh, in Gemini, which is exactly the, the cosmological location of the entrance to the land of the gods. So it appeared that the second myth completely confirmed the Yama flood myth by planetary means. So to put it in a nutshell, on the eve of June solstice in 650 A.D., there was a conjunction of Saturn and Jupiter at sunset. And the next morning, when you would look at the sunrise, you would see very clearly that the Milky Way had parted company with the solstice sun and that, in fact, it was time for the old god to leave the earth because the bridge to the land of the gods had been washed out. So the gods in the myths were connected to the astronomy. And the second myth also marked the events of 650 AD. Well, after I picked myself up off the floor and sat back on my chair, I said I was... I felt like... I felt like I was being talked to across a, a vast gulf of time from 650 A.D. Both myths were telling him how the movements in the heavens were linked, for the Incas, to a parallel series of cataclysms on Earth. It's just a straight fact that every time gain or loss of the Milky Way occurred from 200 BC right up to the Spanish conquest. An archeologist would say at exactly that same time, the most significant events in the Andean ar archeological record occurred. And I think that this point was not lost on the Incas. The Incas became convinced that astronomy was the key to their future because there were these coincidences between astronomy and archeologically known events. For the Incas, the slow movement of the skies was the machinery of fate grinding out the centuries here on Earth. I became increasingly aware that there was a, a very eerie set of correspondences between um, uh, the position of the Milky Way at the solstices and the unfolding of Andean history. And uh, I'm not an astrologer. I don't know anything about astrology. I'm not particularly interested in astrology. But, but I must say that if you, if you are someone who has a bent in that direction, as certainly the priest astronomers in the Andes did, then the Uri coincidences involved must have got their attention. We know that the Andean interest in the stars goes way back in time. And it's not just that it's the greatest light show available. It's not just that at these high altitudes, the Milky Way is intensely brilliant and every star is clearly visible. I, I think it goes beyond that because there's some kind of an innate human connection with trying to understand patterns in the sky. And I believe that that's what the Incas and all the Andean peoples were about, that they were trying to model Earth by heaven. The Incas, like all human beings, didn't want to live in a meaningless world. They wanted to live in a world that had a purpose, God's purpose. What made the Incas different was that they thought they could read that purpose in the sky. And in the end, this was their tragic mistake. Bill now knew that it was because the Incas were so caught up in the unfolding of their fate that when the Spanish arrived, the Incas couldn't see them for what they were, but instead thought them part of God's purpose. This is what had been missing from the conventional story. This was the clue to the deeper history. The traditional account of the of the conquest is one of the most surreal experiences anybody interested in history can undergo. There's no question that the Spanish could have been stopped at any time along their route of ascent into the Andes, but that for some reason the Inca Emperor did not order them stopped. 
Even the Spanish began to wonder why they weren't attacked. The road was so bad that they could very easily have destroyed us in many places. Even with skill, we could not use the horses on the roads, and off the roads, we could take neither horses nor foot soldiers. We know so little about the Inca mind. No one knows for sure why the Inca leader, Atahualpa, did not crush the Spaniards when they were vulnerable. What we do know is that 100 years before the Spanish arrived, the Inca emperor is supposed to have prophesied that there'd be only five more emperors. After that, the Inca way of life and culture, he said, would be utterly destroyed. That fifth emperor, whose doom the prophecy foretold, was the ruler when the Spanish arrived. What bothers people about the prophecy is that uh, it just looks like the Incas made up a story after they got defeated to explain why they were defeated. I spent a long time trying to decide whether or not that this prophecy was, was feasible or believable or, or uh, whether it was, as I said, that it was just an excuse for losing that was cooked up later. But what eventually happened is, is, is that I came across a particular myth. And what the story was, was there is in the sky a yama in the middle of the Milky Way. And this yama each night walks down to the river and drinks all the water from the river because if it did not, the entire world would be destroyed by a flood. And that led me to look, see what was going on in the sky with the yama in 1432. In physical terms, what was happening was, is if you imagine you're looking east, and what they were seeing uh, as time went by was that in the place where the sun was going to rise, the Milky Way was starting to drift in this direction. And by the time of Wiracocha Inca's prophecy, it only had about a century left before it was going to part company with the sun. To the Inca's way of thinking, only at the dawn sun rises where the Milky Way crosses the horizon a spot marked by the Lama constellation, can its rays throw a physical bridge down from the sky to the Earth. Now, physically, that means nothing to us, but cosmologically, it meant something to the Incas because the Milky Way was considered the great causeway which connected the, the gods, the living, and the dead. The Incas believed that they depended on those relationships with the gods and the ancestors. But what Bill realized was that the Incas had seen a horrifying parallel. When the connection to the land of the gods was lost in 650 AD, that had ushered in centuries of civil war. 800 years later, the connection to the land of the ancestors was going to be lost. What catastrophe was this to herald? Well, I went to 1432 to look at what was happening at December solstice. And lo and behold, there was just a uh, a smidgen of the Milky Way left in contact with the, the horizon at the point where the solstice sun rises. And I, I watched it move out for a century until the conquest and bada bing, bada boom. It was just as the Milky Way lost contact with the solstice sunrise that the Spanish arrived. By November the 15th, 1532, the 170 Spaniards finally confronted an army of 40,000 Incas. We never thought that Indians could assemble such a force. Nothing like this had been seen in the Andes until then. We were all filled with fear, few slept. I saw many Spaniards urinate in pure terror without even noticing it. In the decisive battle, 7,000 Incas were killed in one day. <laughs> 
they didn't even raise a weapon in their own defense. For the Incas, the prophecy had simply come true. The Spanish were merely the instrument of fate. After the Battle of Cajamarca, little stood between the Spanish and the heart of the Inca Empire, the holy city of Cusco. Every one of the Inca's gold-encrusted temples was looted and demolished. All that remains are their magnificent foundations. And to proclaim the completeness of their victory, the Spanish built their churches on top. The king and his armies had had their victory. Now the church wanted its own. Now the battle was for hearts and minds, for victory over the Incas to be complete. The old religion had to be wiped out and Catholicism imposed. For the Spanish, the story was complete. The church had got its souls. The king had his gold and empire. And in the clash of cultures, the Incas lost, drowned in a rising tide of progress. But Bill knew the history was not really that simple. The Incas and their culture had never completely disappeared. The battle for their hearts and minds had never been completely won. The Spanish had written the victor's history of the conquest, but Bill had discovered that before the Spanish ever arrived, the Incas believed their doom was already written in the stars, and that this had been part of their downfall. 